Hello, this is Jerry Morton. Welcome to my Finding My Way podcast. This is podcast number 46, titled The Ambush. Podcasts 34 through 61 are stories from the year of Army training I experienced. The training started in August 1966 and ended in June 1967. The stories are published in the book, Reluctant Lieutenant, from Basic to OCS in the 60s, which was published by Texas A&M University Press as a military history. The Ambush is an account of the last two weeks in the woods engaged in war games at Fort McClellan, Alabama in late November 1966. Jerry's spontaneous behavior produced unusual results. It is recommended that you listen to the Army training stories in the order in which they are presented so that you can appreciate the full contextual richness of the later stories. The Ambush The first thing Monday morning, we were trucked out into the field with full gear. It was camping time again. Army camping time, that is. This time, the sergeants were not concerned about base camp attacks. There did not seem to be much order to where we unrolled our sleeping bags. The company just had this area in the woods we occupied. Some of it was clear of trees and brush, and some of it was not. Very little of the ground was level. A dirt road ran through the center of our area. It ran between two low-lying hills that were the center of where we had our sleeping gear spread out. My squad ended up on the side of the left-hand hill near the top. We could not see the road from there, but we could hear the occasional vehicle drive by. It seemed that everywhere you looked were sleeping bags and army gear. The area had been used before. There were half-dug foxholes with edges weathered away, just as in the previous week's base camp area. By the time we had all settled in, it was getting dark. Most of the sergeants walking around were new to our group. They were training cadre. That is, they were not affiliated with the non-coms that gave our company orders back in the barracks area. The sergeants we knew stayed in the civilized area our trucks left. As far as I could tell, the woods sergeants were employed by the Army to meet us in the woods and provide us with a new experience. But then, what did I know? The Army did not consult with me about much of anything. They did not give you a future. You only knew about the present moment or the next most immediate assignment they were presenting to you. Of course, we were constantly reminded of the long-range future by the instructing sergeant's repeated phrase, This will save your life in Vietnam. Just as my squad was policing its empty sea ration tins, a staff sergeant came up to us. Who's your acting squad leader? We don't have one appointed, someone close to where he was standing. Okay. You're acting squad leader, he told the respondent. At 1900 hours, have the squad ready to spend the evening in the field. Make sure everyone has full canteens and gas masks. They can leave the rest of their gear here. Have them stack their rifles over there, he said, pointing to a somewhat level piece of ground we had claimed as our sleeping area, not far from the partially dug foxholes. What will we be doing tonight, Sergeant? Another guy asked. We're going out orienteering through the woods tonight, men. Now get yourselves ready. You have a little more than 40 minutes before we move out. More compass work in the dark. 
Wouldn't you know they'd have us take our gas mask along? We had heard stories about the chemical warfare school people gassing us infantry trainees. No doubt about it. They got a lot of laughs out of making our lives miserable. I put on a fresh pair of socks. Having dry feet was a comfort. My old socks had gotten sweated up when we marched from the trucks to the campsite. They had a water trailer some jeep deposited near the road. We filled up our canteens. While we waited in the growing darkness, we cleaned our rifles, smoked, and joked. During such moments, you always got to know the guys around you. Many of them were college graduates who had chosen not to go to OCS. I had discovered in this way a guy in the company with a master's degree in clinical psychology. He said that he just wanted to serve his two years and get out. He was going to go to a new doctoral program in clinical psychology that was opening up at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro when he got out. His major professor, who was going to be head of that program, had assured him that he would be admitted into the program as soon as he got out of the Army. The soldier wanted to get on with his civilian life just as soon as he could, even if it meant going to Vietnam. He said an Army doctor had talked to him about a direct commission in the Medical Service Corps. Since it meant more time in the Army, he turned it down. His story confirmed to me that I was eligible for the same direct commission. I asked the guy who the doctor was. He said the physician was back at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, where he had done his basic training. I was determined to talk to someone in the Medical Service Corps as soon as we got out of the woods. Okay, men, the sergeant said. We're going to travel about ten miles by compass tonight. We groaned in unison. He laughed and said, it's not that bad. We're not going to be sighting off of each other. We're going to use large landmarks that stand out in the darkness. He was a pleasant teacher. We learned to sight our compasses from one hilltop to a key landmark on the next hilltop. He showed us how to keep checking ourselves by having a reference point behind us. We could keep checking that we were on the right compass heading by keeping both landmarks perfectly aligned. As we trekked through the woods, he told us about his tour of duty in Vietnam the year before. We all stayed bunched up close to him so we could hear what it was like. Where he was stationed, there had not been much shooting. Mainly, they had helped train villagers in military skills, such as how to use firearms and how to follow a compass. It hadn't been much different than what he was doing with us, he said. He had been fired upon. It was hard to see who was shooting at you. That was why we needed to pay attention during the training on how to spot camouflaged soldiers. The sergeant was quite cordial to us. We appreciated him. When the acting squad leader decided to walk in a straight line down a really steep slope, the sergeant pointed out a better way. He was not going to let us foolishly waste our energy. We got back to our sleeping bags at about 3.30 in the morning. I did not mind the lack of sleep so much this time. I had learned a lot that would help me. Walking for long periods of time just did not bother us all that much. We were in good shape. Our problem was the lack of sleep. The day always started at sunrise and was filled with training activities. At night, they would give us more tasks to accomplish. We rarely got more than three or four hours sleep a night in the field. Setting up ambushes and getting ambushed became a major focus of our training. We would be moving through the woods as a squad or a platoon looking for the enemy when we got ambushed. Either we or the enemy wore black armbands. Sometimes the enemy was a squad or a platoon from our company. At other times, they came from a different company. 
We were never issued any tear gas to toss, but someone was, because several times the cry of gas would ring out. We were so conditioned to avoid breathing in the burning tear gas that both the good guys and the bad guys would stop whatever it was they were doing to put on their masks. Getting your gas mask on was critical to your immediate well-being. All firing stopped while people put on their gas masks. Then the everyday task of shooting at each other, changing positions, getting the hell out of there, and the like resumed. Moving through the woods is far more difficult than moving down the dirt road. On a dirt road, you travel in two columns, one on each side of the road. You do not want to get bunched up. People who get too close to one another are usually the first ones to get shot. It is a lot easier to shoot into a group of four or five men all clumped together than it is to shoot at one guy at a time. The enemy will usually take the easy kill first. That was what they told us, so it is highly probable that their sergeants taught them the same lessons. Bunch up and get killed seemed to be the sergeant's motto on the trail. The problem was that everyone liked to talk when you were out in the field, for it helped to pass the time. Since you did not want to talk in a loud voice and let the enemy know you were there, the tendency to bunch up was strong. The worst time to bunch up was when the column stopped. Everyone wanted to smoke and joke when we stopped our march. The sea rations kept us amply supplied with cigarettes. We never ran out. Someone always had extra ones to lend if your personal supply ran low. I stayed with my pipe, so my supply of cigarettes went into the loaning pool. Whenever we stopped, we tended to bunch up. The sergeants would spread us out when they were with us, but usually they were not with us. They would tell us to go from one point to another or to set up an ambush at such and such a spot. Then, when the enemy came by, we were to open up on them with our blank adapter-equipped weapons. They would hunker down and fire back at us. Someone would tell them to move out after we were all about out of ammunition. We would go back to wherever we were supposed to go and get another assignment. The hardest part about marching in two columns down the road was keeping flank security. Two or three guys would be assigned to walk in the woods along both sides of the road, just about out of sight from the guys on the road. Theoretically, the guys on flank security would see the enemy hiding in the woods waiting to ambush us. Their warning would enable us to escape the killing zone. That was what they called the spot where all of the ambushers' weapons were pointed. When we entered the killing zone, they would open fire and kill us all. Since we were just playing war, no one got killed. All the same, you did not even like to pretend that you had been caught in a killing zone. If it happened in play, it could happen for real later on. The flankers had to walk faster and harder than the guys on the road. They did not have a nice flat surface to walk on. The trees, wait a minute vines, and underbrush kept slowing the flankers down. If they did not walk fast enough, they fell behind, which negated their purpose for being out there. It did not take much time for the flankers to lose sight of the column and get lost. Getting lost out in the woods that you knew nothing about or losing the way back to base camp was to be avoided at all costs. Our group never lost anyone. We were lucky. Stories circulated about the guys being lost for several hours. Fortunately, there were so many trainees marching and ambushing each other 
that you would eventually find some group of guys to join up with. More often than not, they would be from a different company. You would spend many sleepless hours finding someone who knew where your group and sleeping gear were. For the additional security against being ambushed, the column would have a point man and someone trailing behind the rear. The point man always walked well ahead of the column, looking for signs of the enemy, hoping to see them before the main column arrived. He could run back and halt the column. Then, whoever was in charge could decide on whether to surprise the ambushers by charging them or going around them without a fight. The rear guard stayed back from the main column, protecting it from any enemy trying to sneak up on it from behind. Keeping up with the column was not as hard for the flankers when we were all moving through the woods without the aid of a roadbed. They could keep up with the column more easily because everyone was dodging trees and being held back by wait-a-minute vines. Unfortunately, the flankers also had a much easier time getting lost from the main column. They did not have the roadbed as a constant reference point. As a result, the flankers usually stayed fairly close to the main column. That reduced security, but it minimized the chances of getting lost. The point man was the key position for moving the column through the woods. If he could not find the path of at least resistance through the tangle of underbrush, everybody suffered. I seemed to have a knack for finding the easiest route through the woods. More often than not, I was the point man. Sometimes we would get someone who definitely did not have the knack. After a while, the guys would ask me to take on the task as a favor. I liked the role. I imagined that this must have been the way Daniel Boone moved through the backwoods of Kentucky. I liked being in the woods. The downside was being so tired. Guys kept falling asleep whenever we stopped to take a break. You always had to check your buddy when the order was given to move out. He could be sitting on a log, sound asleep. If someone did not wake him up, he would sleep there for several hours. He would never find the column when he woke up. I just could not understand how they fell asleep like that. But it was a fact. They did. Very quickly, flank security became a thing of the past. We were always in a hurry to get somewhere. The flankers slowed everything down. We traded security for speed. Being ambushed or ambushing a column was pretty routine. The fun was in the surprise. If you were the ambusher, finding a good spot in which to conceal yourself while still having a good field of fire was key to a successful operation. The next important point was making sure that everyone had the discipline to hold their fire until the target was between your first and last rifleman so that you had the enemy clearly trapped. No one could escape the killing zone and double back on you from the front or charge up the side of your firing line from the rear. A real problem for the acting leader of the ambushers was determining if the enemy patrol was too big to ambush. A squad of seven or eight men springing an ambush on a column of 5,000 men probably would not fare very well. It was hard to know how many men were in approaching column unless you had a clear view of the whole area. Since the ambushers were hidden in the trees, their overall field of vision was limited. It was always risky business. A big disappointment was to lie out all night alongside some trail, waiting for the enemy to wander into your trap, only to have him never arrive. This meant that you did not get to go back to your nice warm sleeping bag. In fact, 
you did not get any sleep at all unless you accidentally fell asleep. Falling asleep on ambush duty is dangerous for obvious combat reasons. The war game reason we did not want to fall asleep was more basic. You would disappoint your buddies. If the ambush were sprung, you wanted all the rifle fire noise you could make. This gives the enemy the impression that there are a whole lot more of you than is actually the case. A lot of noise from your rifles and machine guns tends to discourage adventurism. If enemy soldiers think they can overpower your position by charging through the woods to capture you, they will do it. Convincing them that they would have been killed in an ambush if it had been a real firefight was always difficult. The fact that they were alive with two or three of them holding you to the ground was proof to them that they had survived. You were a prisoner. Surprise and firepower were important elements for a successful ambush during training. Being ambushed is not all that much fun. First comes the shock of surprise and the sinking feeling that in the real world you would be dead right about then. As soon as the enemy opens up on you, you duck for cover while trying to fire back. There is a period of total confusion. Usually, your first move to take cover proves to be inadequate. The little ditch you are in is not deep enough because your butt is sticking out. The little sapling you are trying to hide behind is only wide enough to protect your nose, or you are hiding directly in front of the guy who is firing his rifle at you. While both sides are hunkered down firing at each other, almost everyone is trying to figure out how to get out of this mess. The best feeling occurs when you discover that you are about to be ambushed and you ambush the ambushers. At least that's what the sergeants told us. Our group never got that lucky. In fact, I never heard of any patrol pulling that off. We just took the sergeant's word for it and imagined it to be true. Friday night came. We were all dead tired. It was a relief to march in column down a dirt road because you could close your eyes for a few steps. Those blind steps eased the tiredness. The word was that trucks would take us back to the barracks in the morning. We would then get Saturday afternoon and Sunday off. Everyone I knew planned to sleep the whole time. The next week would be our last week in AIT. There would be no more camping trips, or so the rumor mill said. We would have daylight training exercises, but be in the barracks every night. Then it was back to Kentucky for me. I had two and a half weeks of leave over the Christmas holidays to be with Anna. Then I would go to Fort Benning, Georgia, for six months of infantry officer candidate school. That Friday night, a full moon was just starting to wane. You could see fairly well in the moonlight. We had been fortunate during our two weeks in the field. There were no clouds of consequence to blot out the moon. It had produced a lot of light. The light created deep shadows. If you were on patrol, the landscape was easy to move through. A downside was the dark shadows. The shadows from the trees made it easy to conceal yourself if you were an ambusher. Troops could get fairly close to the trail or roadbed without being seen as long as they stayed motionless. Ambushers had the advantage. Of course, the ambushed were less likely to run blindly into trees as they sought cover. None of us had a bath throughout that week. Our lack of sleep, foul-smelling bodies, and filthy clothing combined into one deep weariness. Walking up the hill to our bid rolls was a relief. It was almost midnight. 
This was the earliest by far we had gotten back to our sleeping bags. The other nights it was usually 3 or 3.30 in the morning. We were beat, but happy. Our platoon had been out on one more patrol. We had started about 2 in the afternoon, 1,400 hours military time. We had eaten supper on the trail. No one had ambushed us. We had found no bushwhackers. Earlier that night, some cadre sergeants had pulled out our squad to march down a trail that circled back to our base camp. We suspected that we were being set up as someone's lost patrol to walk into a predetermined ambush spot. Tom had been designated the acting squad leader for the patrol. He was cautious by nature. We moved slowly down the trail, hoping to catch the ambushers before they caught us. I was a little frustrated with Tom, He was too cautious, in my opinion. Finally, he agreed that we did not need flankers. That made our time on the dirt road pass faster. Faster is a relative term. We were faster than we had been, but we were pretty slow compared to a walk in the park talking to your girl. It had been a long, tedious walk. But it was over. No one had ambushed us. If there was a prepared ambush, the poor guys had set it up at the wrong spot or at the wrong time. They would probably have to stay out all night waiting for the lost patrol to show up while we were catching Z's in our nice warm sacks. We sank down beside our makeshift foxholes with tired relief. I propped my back against a tree with my legs stretched straight out in front of me. It felt so good. None of us felt much like talking. We just sat there feeling relieved that it was over. All we had to do now was crawl into the sack, sleep, eat, march to the trucks, and ride back to the barracks. Life was good. Apparently, we were the first ones in our company to get back. The hill was quiet. Our moment of bliss was disturbed by the sound of a pair of combat boots coming up the hill toward our position. In the moonlight, we finally made out one of the cadre sergeants, who had been with us on and off during the whole week. You men, he said as he approached, there's one more ambush for you to pull off. We groaned in unison. Tom, still playing the role of acting squad leader, used his rifle as a stick to help his tired bones line up into a standing position. Sergeant, we are through for the night he said matter-of-factly. The sergeant laughed. It's still a little early to call it a night. After you pull off the ambush, you can come back and sleep. By this time, we were all getting up. We surrounded the sergeant to get our orders without much comment. The ambush site isn't far down the road, explained, pointing to the left. About a mile down the road, there's a fork. A platoon will be coming down it in 30 or 40 minutes. They'll take the right fork. You uh, set up the ambush along that fork. When they come by you, open up on them. After you spring the ambush, you can come back up here and go to bed. The whole thing will be over in an hour. Two at the most. Tom quietly asked, Isn't a platoon a little big for a squad to take on? Go over to the group of sergeants standing over there, the sergeant said, motioning to the five or six sergeants semi-huddled around a fire barrel for warmth. They were smoking and laughing, their murmured conversations reaching us from forty yards or so away. They were on the same elevation of the hill we were on. 
They'll uh, rig up one of your M14s to fire on full automatic and mount a brace on the front so you can use it as an automatic weapon firing from the prone position. That will give you the firepower you need. Be sure to get some extra ammo magazines for it. We all nodded. Collecting our gear and strapping on our web belts, as a group of one sluggish mind, we begin wearily moving to the stand of sergeants. Our instructing sergeant walked with us. I'll be here on the hill tonight. When you've sprung your ambush, come on back here and let me know. Then you can crawl in the sack, okay? Okay. A couple of us replied, somewhat in unison, but without much enthusiasm. As we approached the collection of sergeants, R spoke to them. This uh, squad is doing the ambush at the fork. Tim, ring up one of their M14s for automatic fire and give them plenty of ammo so they can make enough noise to keep people off their backs. He spoke in a hushed tone that matched theirs. The eight of us collected our ammo and began walking down the hill in a semi-spread-out fashion, but close enough to each other that we could talk. What do you think? Tom asked me. Oh, it ought to be an easy enough ambush if there are trees close to the road. The ground is level. In this light, the shadows should conceal us. It's not a far walk. I think the sergeant may just be giving us a break, came my reply. Tom, let's just, let's just get this over quickly. We're all tired. Let's get it done and get back to camp in short order. Okay, help me pick out a good ambush site, he replied. We walked down the road in double file with our rifles at High Port. No one else was on the road. It was quiet and peaceful. The dark shadows in the trees stretched across the road like black charcoal lines on coarse gray paper. The night was crisp. We needed the field jackets we were wearing. They made us feel warm and secure. We were going back to the barracks in the morning. An ambush was routine work for us after a solid week of them. We were confident we knew what we were doing and that we were doing it well. We felt good. Here's the fork, Tom announced as he started to go to the left branch. No, 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 hold on, Tom, one of the guys said. The sergeant said he wanted us to set up the ambush on the right side. That's right, Tom, I said, supporting the statement. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry about that. It happens when you get when you get tired. Tom half chuckled to himself. The fork was wide and on level ground. There was a ditch on both sides of the road going to the right. It looked like a bulldozer had recently cleared it out. A few down tree trunks had been pushed into small piles every fifty yards or so along the road. The center of the dirt road was just slightly higher than the ground on its tree-lined sides. They must have cleared out the underbrush when they were making the ditches on both sides of the road. Tom, let, let's not go too far down this fork. Anywhere along the far side of this fork will be a good ambush site. Look at how the tree shadows will conceal our positions, I said, pointing into the tree line. The trees were mostly pine. They were tall and straight without branches coming out of the trunk until they were twelve or so feet off the ground. As far as you looked into the forest, there were tall pines with just enough hardwoods mixed in to provide the ground with a soft cover of fallen leaves and dry pine needles. The patchy mix of muted ground cover paired with the slashing shadows of the trees crisscrossing the ground made concealing yourself easy as long as you did not move. Okay, let's form a firing line just inside the first row of trees, he said, pointing into the woods. We are about 50 yards down the road's right fork. 
In my opinion, we should have spread out a little more. About eight feet separated each of us from the next man. Tom had placed the M14 set to fire on automatic in the third position from where the road split. His thinking was that if the platoon was not completely into our killing zone when something triggered the ambush, the automatic weapon could swing and fire at the rear of the column. It would cut down those guys if they were not caught in the first volley of shots. I thought it was a good plan with the exception that we should have been spread out more. After we were all set and lying in our prone positions, I told Tom that I wanted to walk down the road and try to see if I could spot our guys in the shadows. Tom agreed. As long as our guys stayed motionless, you could not see them from the road. I knew pretty much where everybody was. Yet I had to strain to see them in the shadows despite knowing that they were there and despite their relative closeness to the road. This was looking good. Their low profile lying in the prone position was perfect. We were set. I resumed my position in the firing line. The dry leaves and pine needles kept the moisture in the ground from reaching us. Lying prone with my head propped in my hands and my elbows planted in the ground was so relaxing. It could be easy to drift off to sleep. In the shadows I could see that some of the guys had their heads resting on the ground. If we had to wait any time at all for the platoon to show up, we could be in trouble. No one wanted to go to sleep. This was the last ambush. We did not want to mess it up. So far, we had done all right in training. We did not want to blow it now. You could hear them coming. The unmistakable sounds of canteens bumping into metal clips and gear inside backpacks hitting other gear reached our ears. These guys were really sloppy. The clanking was pronounced. Maybe they were National Guard guys. You would think that some sergeant would have shaped them up by now. As they got closer, the clanging, bumping, and bangling of dangling equipment grew louder. Then the muttering of their voices and the crunching of lots of boots in the gravel dirt road grew in volume. This was the noisiest, most undisciplined group of soldiers we had heard for the full two weeks we had been in the field. These guys were pathetic. I just could not believe it. Looking into the darkness, I could see our guys perking up on both sides of me. We locked and loaded. You could hear them approach the fork. Tom and I nodded to each other, smiling. We were going to get to go to bed early tonight. Oh, no. They were taking the wrong fork. They were taking the left fork instead of the one we're on. You could hear them plainly as day in the darkness. They were laughing quietly as they began moving away. Tom got up. I got up. We all got up. Huddled in the center of the road, I said to everyone, they, They've taken the wrong fork. Can, can you believe that? The fools can't keep quiet and they can't read a map. Tom said in desperation, We'll have to lay out here in the woods all night. We can't go back until we've sprung the ambush. Hell, this isn't fair. It's just not fair. I'm going to bring them back, I said. I was mad. Just because of some fools, we might have to spend the whole night out here. It just wasn't right. How are you going to do that, Tom asked. I'll just run up between the two columns and tell them they took the wrong fork. I'll tell them they have to turn around and take the right fork. I said with indignation. They'll see that you're not one of them. Someone behind me said, you don't have a black armband on. In the confusion and the weak like no one will notice, 
If I'm spotted, I'll break into the woods. No one wants to chase me in the woods, I blurted out without pausing to think too much. Okay, Tom said. We'll go back in the woods and wait for you. Good, I said over my shoulder as I began my jogging run to catch the receding column on the other fork. As always, my M14 was held up at high port. It did not take more than a minute or two to catch up to the rear of the column. I was not even breathing hard. Jogging further up the middle of the road, passing the troops on either side, I did not give them much more than a glance. None of them seemed to be raising their heads to look at me. In the darkness, I could not tell how much further the column extended. There seemed to be a lot of men in this platoon. Still jogging, I shouted out, Who's in charge? Who's in charge here? Without a doubt, this was the most disorganized group of trainees I had ever encountered. The whole mess just made me mad. Who the hell is in charge here? I demanded. From the darkness in front emerged a panting figure running toward me. As if ready to repel an assault, I halted in the middle of the dirt road with my legs spread and my weapon at high port. I was angry and frustrated. Here, here I am. The panting figure puffed as his form took shape before my eyes. He was definitely overweight. Something was wrong with this picture. Coming to a halt directly in front of me and whipping out a salute so sharp that his elbow almost hit me in the face, the figure said, I'm, (coughs) I'm, (coughs) I'm in charge. He sucked in his breath, still frozen with that salute. I looked in fear at the clear silver insignia attached to his field jacket. Oh, 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 I had a lieutenant colonel huffing and puffing in my face, thinking I was an officer and saluting me. I would go to jail. I was going to jail for the rest of my life for impersonating an officer during wartime. Oh, help me, help me, somebody, please help me. Those thoughts raced through my mind as the colonel stood in my face with his fixed salute. I had to do something. I had to do something now. I had to salute an officer when he saluted me. Snapping a brisk salute, I began speaking as he lowered his arm. You've taken the wrong fork. You'll be here all night, I stated. Reverse this column and take the other fork now, sir. He immediately turned and barked out the order. Call him! Halt! They stopped. Every one of them stopped and stood there in silence. About haste, he ordered. Up and down the sides of the road, combat boots turned on the packed hard ground and crunched as every soldier obeyed the order. Forward! Harch! came his next command. Again his order was obeyed without comment. The colonel saluted me again. I returned it and trotted to the head of the column. I stayed in my position in the center of the road, walking between the two rows of men and staying in step with them. I looked straight ahead so as to avoid eye contact with anyone. They might recognize me as a stranger or spot my fear. Hell, I thought, just just might work out okay. If anyone nags me, I complete ignorance. I thought this was the platoon we were supposed to ambush. When they took the wrong fork in the road, I just went out to get them back. All I wanted to do was ambush somebody and go to bed. How was I supposed to know that some lieutenant colonel was out here leading a group of recruits out on some special activity? What was a lieutenant colonel doing in the field with a bunch of recruits anyway? Something was really wrong here. As the column began turning the corner to take the correct fork in the road, the movement brought me closer to the men marching on the left. Oh, no. Oh, no, I'm in real trouble. The man closest to me is wearing captain's bars, and the next one has on a major's oak leaves. Two more sets of captain bars flash in the moonlight. They're all officers. This is a whole column of officers. That's why a lieutenant colonel is leading them. They're all officers. 
They must be a training group of chemical warfare officers out on night field maneuvers. How do I get myself into these things? I'm going to jail. Oh, this is bad. This is very, very bad, I say to myself. What can I do to get out of this mess? Looking to the right in my panic, I can see Tom's face in the tree line. There's Tom's face and those of a couple of the other guys. Tom's face is raised above his rifle. It is pale white, and his eyes are big and white, as are those of the others. They can see the flashing bars and leaves on the shoulders of the officers. They know that these are officers, and they won't open up. The hell, I say. In one quick, smooth motion, I level my M14. Blam, 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 blam. The M14 barks as I shout as loud as I can. Ambush, ambush. Take cover, ambush. The guys in my squad immediately open up. (laughs) Speak the rifles in the automatic weapon as they spit fire toward the road. All hell is breaking loose. The officers on both sides of the road scurry for cover. Some are prone in the ditch. Some have huddled behind down tree trunks. Everything and everyone is moving fast. Suddenly, I am the only one left standing in the road. I had managed to empty my magazine into the woods. Everyone will know I don't belong here if I stay in the middle of the road. I've got to seek cover, too. Move, move, you fool, move! Is a dominant thought flooding my mind. Hunching over, I move quickly toward a log immediately to my right front. Two captains are squatted down behind it. As I approach them, one of them looked me straight in the eye and spat out, What the hell? We weren't supposed to get ambushed tonight. What the hell's going on? You're right, I instinctively responded. There's been some kind of foul up. I got closer to them. I had to fit in. Don't stand out and you'll be safe. Rid- Race through my mind. Hey, who are you? The captain asked with surprise in his eyes. Turning his head to the other captain, he reached for my jacket and shouted, He's not one of us! He's not one of us! I started to pull away, but it was too late. He had a firm grasp on my collar. Colonel! Colonel! He's not one of us! The captain screamed as I strained to pull out free of his grip. He did not let go. The strength of my legs backing away from him was dragging both of us into the center of the roadbed. He kept shouting, but my panic kept me from hearing as the other captain began to with understand the situation. Oh, he was reaching for me with clawing hands, clutching at the air. Panic time for the kid. Gas, 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 gas. I screamed in total terror. Instantaneously, the captain let go of me. He grabbed for his gas mask and frantically began putting it on, as did his fellow officer. I backed into the center of the road, unsnapped my own gas mask in, as I unthinkingly ran towards the front of the column, pulled it over my face. Just as I was securing it, covering my face, the puffing colonel came running toward me with his mask. Eye lenses already fogging over. The mask filter had a muffling effect, but I was able to hear him say, What is it? What's going on? Get these men out of here, I screamed. Pumping my right arm up and down, signaling for him to double time. Get them out now, out now. Without hesitation, he turned and repeated the double-time signal, shouting as best he could, Double-time! Double-time! Get these men out of here! Double-time! His muffled shouts continued as he disappeared into the darkness, the entire column matching his pace. Slowly, the guys in the woods stood up. They walked towards me as I stood in the middle of the road watching in amazement as the dust kicked up by the running officers started to disappear. Those were officers, Tom said in a stunned voice. Yeah, I discovered that too late, I said with a slight smile. Where in a world of shit, somebody else added. Not not necessarily, I chimed in. Look, we were out here to spring an ambush. We didn't know that a platoon or so of officers would be coming by. When they took the wrong fork, I thought they were trainees making a mistake. It's my fault. You you didn't know who they were. I was the one who went out and brought them back into our field of fire. If anyone gets in trouble, it will be me, okay? 
Okay, okay, Sam said impatiently, but we don't want you to get into trouble. Well, maybe I won't. This one needs to play itself out. I... Oh, what, what should we tell the sergeants, another asked. We'll, we'll, we'll just walk up to them, tell them we sprang the ambush and we're going to hit the sack, I stated. It's the truth. We don't need to tell him or anybody else anything unless they ask us for more. Okay, okay, that's what we'll do, Tom said. Just don't talk about it, I pleaded. Don't tell anybody and maybe nothing will happen to me. We'll all be gone in a week. If we can keep it quiet that long, I'll be safe. You, you know, I could go to jail for this. Please don't bring it up. If anybody asks anything, we'll tell the truth. You aren't to blame for anything. I was the one that brought them to you. You couldn't help it. Just please don't bring it up unless you have to. We were all in agreement. Tom and I took the lead as the squad climbed the hill to where the sergeants were, still grouped around the fire barrel. The other guys hung back a ways. The sergeant who had sent us out on the ambush recognized Tom as the two of us approached him. What happened? he asked. We sprang the ambush, sergeant, replied Tom. Can we hit the sack now? Sure. How did it go? he asked as he turned to leave. I looked back over my shoulder and said, about like all the others, Sergeant. Fine. You men go on and get some sleep now. Okay. Thanks, Sergeant, Tom replied as we retreated into the darkness. No one said much of anything as we took off our boots, slipped our rifles into our sleeping bags to protect them from prowling sergeants, and then followed our M14s into the comfort of our homes. As I was drifting off to sleep, I noticed several men come running up the hill to speak to the huddle of sergeants. I could not make out what was being said. The two newcomers were waving their arms as they talked. They were excited about something. A spontaneous roar of laughter erupted from the group of sergeants as one of them pointed over to us. They thought our adventure was funny, I reasoned. They were not mad. We would be protected, was my thought, as I drifted into sleep. Morning came earlier than I was ready to greet it, as usual. Our time was filled with breaking camp, packing, and forming up for the long march to the trucks. Later, when we were bunched up with all of the other guys waiting for the order to board, I overheard a group of trainees talking. Did you hear uh, that jeep driving up and down the road last night? A guy asked. Yeah, said another. It had a loud speaker on it, but I, I couldn't make out what it was saying. Me either, piped in someone else. All I could make out was something about an ambush in the chemical warfare school. They wanted information about a soldier. They were, they were looking for someone who could tell them about a soldier who had done something to the chemical warfare school, I thought they said, another voice from the group added. Tom and I looked at each other. Neither of us said a word. I smiled as I reached down from the back of the deuce and a half and pulled him up. He patted me on the back. No one ever spoke to me about the incident. <laughs>